Now, one of the things, like I said, I spent a lot of time in the building, and I'm always interested when the news says the Pentagon says. Well, first of all, the Pentagon says nothing. The Pentagon is a big stone building. And it doesn't talk, but it's inhabited by about 29,000 people that, that work, uh, work in there. <clears throat> now, people say the, you know, the military doesn't say that there are admit UFOs. That's apparently not true. This goes back to 1947 and the Twining Memorandum and them you know, putting out the word that, yeah, UFOs are real. So I know there's a mythology out there that says, you know, the Pentagon denies the existence. That has never been true. Now, what they are and getting into it now, that is a totally uh, different story. One of the things that's interesting is this was a uh, secret memorandum that went out, um, and it was done by Twining right after Roswell. Now, this is an internal mechanism talking to the internal uh, department, and it, uh, while it talks about the reality, what's missing in this is any indication of a crash or Roswell or sp bodies in general. Now, so there's good news and bad news. Now, one of the things I learned, you've probably heard about bass, and, the, uh, and I'm going to come to the uh, other study that was done fairly recently. So the good news and bad news. And they say here, the government doesn't know what the government knows. There is no the government. That's just not the way the system works. Uh, but the point is here, there are a number of people, we'll get to some of the numbers, that are interested in the area, and most of because they've had personal observations. But in reality, most of them don't care. We'll talk to, to some of those issues. Now, they keep talking about disclosure, and I argue this is not the greatest story never told. That we have had, as you see, a number of presidents, uh, he, those of you will recognize, you know, our three, uh, uh, Truman, uh, Carter, and uh, as you know, Ronald Reagan actually chased UFOs and that, Gorbachev, again, uh, various governments across the world, the Vatican, all saying, yay, verily, UFOs are real. Now, what are the countries that have done disclosure on it? All of these uh, countries have, you know, published many, many uh, documents saying, yep, UFOs are real, and here's our experience with it. Now, we were told that terrible things would happen, that, uh, you know, it would be the end of the world, and end of religion as we know it, and all that. And the reality is this has been pretty much the public response. Now, I understand that, you know, and we'll get to it, but there's a big difference between this group and public in general. Now, Another thing we hear is, if they agree this, you know, this would change everything and change your paradigm. I'm sorry, but, you know, confirmation of what you already believe is not a big paradigm changer. Yeah, and it doesn't, you know, the real so what. Now, we'll talk about you know, so the uh, UFOs, and you're familiar, of course, with the bodies and all that. In the UFO book, well, I have an entire lengthy chapter on how the government works. And I will step out and say, most of you do not know how the government works. I can tell you that when I was Inspector General uh, in the Pentagon, we had to have a course for colonels and lieutenant colonels to explain to them how the system works. It is terribly complex. And the simplest answers just don't get it. A complete lack of critical thinking and ergofusion is a term I defined, but I did get it published, um, actually in the Harvard International Review. And I called it the misidentification of causal relationships. I mean, you know, identity, if A, therefore B. And that turns you know, And, well, most people believe in UFOs. The vast majority of the people do. It's just not important to most people. Um, how do systems work? Well, first of all, large institutions exist to serve themselves. They are rule-based systems, and they have priorities. And number one priority, and you're watching this going on in, in real time now, is retaining power. 
uh, first thing you do is you keep your job, keep getting, you know, reelected. The other thing is the golden rule, and that is he who has the gold make the rule. So you have tremendous fights uh, over the budgetary process. And the requirements are based on a, a logic-based system. Every department has specific things that they are authorized and appropriated to do. And one of the things I point out is down at the bottom, there is no de uh, U.S. Department of Good Ideas. So it's got to fit inside of existing systems. Now, I'm going to go through quickly here. Um, I had put together in you know, the start, I guess, in 1983, the Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group. And the reason we use that name is FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, had just come into being. And we didn't think anybody would ask for in all the documents on uh, you know, advanced theoretical physics. Uh, and also, there, there were rules. And one of the rules was there was no written uh, explanation. The people came from all the services. Uh, from the intelligence community and from aerospace and all had minimum top secret and SCI level clearances if you know what, uh, what those are. And you had to be knowledgeable and whatnot. And basically what we found was nobody's minding the store. Everybody thought somebody else was doing that. They all knew all the folklore and whatnot. And everybody said, gee, I thought you were doing that. You were responsible. And uh, that was generally not true. Uh, <clears throat> what we did, we uh, ended up, I started at lower levels, and I ended up briefing higher and higher levels. Literally got to either the director or the deputy director of all of those three-letter agencies. And the interesting thing there was they said, yeah, it was interesting, I heard that, uh, some, but two, you know, all of them just said, you know, this is uh, not in our bailiwick. Now, what we did know was that there were cases of military significance that probably should have been looked at harder. There were also lots of physical evidence. And the other problem, of course, was, was it not going away, and as you see, uh, didn't over time. This was our suspected scenario. It was Raiders of the Lost Ark. We believed that Roswell was probably real, uh, that people had looked at it, said, what the hell, can't figure this out, boxed it up. You remember the last scene, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark going out and getting put into Suitland or some uh, place like that and say, well, we'll come back and look at it uh, over time. <clears throat> the next few slides are actually ones that I gave. Well, remember, the time frame now is 1980s. Well, I have you know, literally scanned them in. That's why there's no color to them. I didn't redo it. But this is what we uh, were, were looking at. Uh, SDI is Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, you remember at that time, big deal, we'll get that. Potential for cover and deception. Another was that, hey, there ought to be ability, if the capabilities that we're seeing, we ought to have understand the capability increase, so we ought to be able to jumpstart things. And finally, uh, this is the bad old days, you know, Soviet uh, understanding or breakthrough would be unacceptable. <clears throat> Said this was it, you know, can't tell, does matter. Um, Condon report was there. Now, when I say Condon was right, the question to Condon was not, are there UFOs? It was, are UFOs a threat? And his answer was, this is not a threat. And we haven't been invaded, or apparently not, and, and so that uh, kind of makes sense. Uh, one of the uh, conclusions, though, that we disagreed with when he said, not of scientific uh, value. Uh, the other problem, if you actually read the report, Condon was involved in the conclusions and recommendations. He did not get involved at all in any of the studies. And when you read the report, some of it was pretty good. And it talks about real serious cases in there, and that's inconsistent with the uh, findings of the study. So wh what were we looking at? Let's say rapid acceleration, high G turns, uh, stealth kinds of things. So we were just beginning to talk about stealth and interruption with uh, the uh, electrical 
materials. Uh, we had high credibility witnesses uh, buried between multiple ones and twos and thousands. Duration was from seconds to hours uh, and even on to months in some cases. And what you saw was a high consistency over time. Uh, here are just some of the physical effects. Again, the point here is that 1980s we had acknowledged um, all of these things. The RB47 case was one that went on for 90 minutes. This was an early um, ECM electronic uh, warfare uh, aircraft that's traced uh, as picking up signals uh, and about the 3 gigahertz range. And what's interesting is you have multiple radars from different locations that are picking up another widget that's flying along that's not supposed to be there. They dive and move. And anyway, the case is looked at, and no doubt about the reality, but no kind of, One of the questions is, do satellites pick them up? And the answer is yes. This again is early, um, you can see 1984. This is satellites in geosynchronous orbit, meaning very high, it's very cold. It is staring at the Earth. And one of the reasons it was classified for a long time was where it was looking at. Again, this is bad old days. But the point is, here's the satellite way, way up and something very hot flew by the satellite and was going down uh, towards Earth. Looked at it, and again, the bottom line was, have no idea what this is. Uh, this was uh, another satellite photo taken over Point Barrel, Alaska, in which you're seeing, you know, Alaska is cold, right? And you see this very, very hot uh, signature is coming up. Uh, I went to NORAD, I was having a, a, at a briefing there, and I thought I'd be a smart ass and say, uh, do you have, uh, you know, do you ever get things with very fast acceleration describing some of the things? And the answer was, oh, you mean UFOs? Yes. Uh, did not want to go any further. And the point was uh, that uh, they had thousands of, of reportings on there, which went ba uh, basically nowhere. I might mention one of the guys that I briefed, my last assignment was the director of advanced system concepts for the Army, the Army had laboratory command. And my boss was a uh, two-star general, and his prior job had been uh, as a, um, a staff officer. Well, they had brigadiers out at uh, Cheyenne Mountain that were, you know, monitoring these going on. I asked him about it, and, you know, I believe this was, I hate to use the pun, but definitely not on his radar. This was not something that he was familiar with. And what we found was in talking to people who work in these jobs, they learn very quickly, reporting things you can't explain is not career enhancing. So this is not something you want to report up the chain. Uh, got involved in the Cash Landrum case. I ended up in this uh, tangentially. George Saris, who was a friend of mine, this, this actually ended up in the uh, Army. Uh, I think, uh, to everybody familiar with well, I'm assuming you know Cash Landrum. It's a very really popular case. You know, two men and a boy radiated near uh, Houston, Texas, and all that. We got, well, the Air Force got sued initially, and they, they threw it to the Army, saying this is one where the helicopters are around, and they said, these are Chinook helicopters, they belong to the Army. So it came to the Army IG, and this friend of mine who picked up on it, and they looked, and there's absolutely no doubt that the event happen and that the two women, uh, you know, Betty Cash died from uh, leukemia, but that they had all been seriously irradiated and it was directly correlated to uh, what they had described. Uh, Betty had gone out and got in front of the car, whole body radiation. Uh, Cody little, was the, well, now a grown man, but had gotten out run scared. He got jumped back. He didn't have as much. But the point was that the severity of the symptoms were what we call LD100. <clears throat> that means should have died, just without doubt, and yet didn't. Never could uh, explain this. Uh, the JAL flight, this is no one, you know, the <clears throat> pilots flying along. And importantly, you had confirmation from multiple radar systems flying along, and it was something, you, know, you could say, uh, larger than uh, aircraft carriers. And this went on for quite a while. Uh, the Alaskan reports, these you don't have, but I did include them in the book. <clears throat> but it was interesting, again, as uh, people knew that I was interested in the area, 
and had been an inspector general and, and some of our guys had been up in Alaska um, on a, a study. And um, what happened is they found a, a bunch of reports and they, there was something called the Alaskan Scouts. Again, bad old days. Uh, we had guys, the Eskimos, literally, who went out hunting seals, and they would belong to the National Guard, have a radio, and I don't know if you know it, but yeah, the Soviets used to try to sneak in all the time, so their job was just to report when you, you know, had incidents going on. Well, they had a whole series of incidents on UFOs, um, and uh, you know the point was they put a key report came in and literally ended up in drawers because nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, this is an example. <clears throat> As you can imagine, they understand the environment. They have to watch it. Life is literally depending on it out there, and they talk about UFOs like this getting cl up in the clouds and watching the clouds move against the wind. <laughs> Lots of those cases. These are the Gulf Breeze case. Again, this was uh, significant. Um, how, you know, one of the things is you had you know hundreds of witnesses. This changed lifestyles. Uh, this was so common that people would every evening go out to uh, Gulf Breeze and go down on the area and look and uh, did the photo analysis and said, yep, lots of aircraft taking. Uh, I know that there was a lot of controversy around Ed Walters who wrote the book on it, uh, but there was, uh, when Bruce Maccabee did a big study on you know, the Gulf Breeze without Ed. Uh, the Iranian case, this is one, you know, the interceptors came in. Uh, they had, um, as they, they flew in and approached it, and uh, as they did, all of a sudden their electronics were uh, shut off. Uh, the, one of the pilots said he went to fire a missile. Uh, what is not clear is whether if he thought this or he actually activated the simple uh, system to fire. Uh, it shut down all their electronics, and they had to bank, and they come out and electronics came back up. And I said, in my job, I was, uh, we were looking at a lot of, you know, high power microwaves and all that. I know how to shut you down, but it's one way. What I don't know how to do is to shut you down and turn you back on again when you wait. And again, this was long before uh, the, the state of the art uh, today. Um, through the Brazilian case, I'm going to have to go fast because we're going to run out of time. Uh, this one I think you're familiar with, the uh, 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 missile launch cases, um, and I had talked to all of the key people uh, that were involved. Uh, you probably, I don't know if um, Bill Salas, or I'm sorry, Bob Salas has been in, but he was down below. But this one, you had launch control officers who were down below watching the missiles go offline. You have guards up above who are scared. So you've got UFOs uh, chasing them. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the big thing, you had one site, uh, Bob says, when he called in to uh, SAC uh, headquarters saying we've got six out of uh, uh, six to eight out of ten missiles are down and he said I haven't got time for that because the uh, echo site another site there is down ten for ten how rare is this you would expect for the entire uh, wing maybe two per year so to have and this is interrupting our strategic uh, systems Oh, just briefly, the Soviets uh, had the same thing. You had George Knapp in. He's the one who actually found this case. This is one where you've got a uh, UFO uh, hovering over a missile base uh, for hours, hundreds of uh, witnesses. And what was uh, of interest there, and what was very different, was uh, they said our missiles, they shut down. Their missiles, they started spinning up. And the launch control officers, my God, we're about to start World War III and I can't stop it. And fortunately, just before the launch actually occurred, they shut off as well. But again, a high correlation between the UFO hovering there uh, and the incident. Uh, again, I'm assuming, you know, Bent Waters, uh, this is one of, I think, the best cases that's out there. I know uh, all of these folks. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key things about Bent Waters is that it was not a singular incident or even one or two. Turns out incidents had been going on long before that, did not get the uh, dramatic attention. 
And actually, spooky stuff has kind of been going on. I talked to Chuck uh, on this recently, and even after they closed the base, uh, it, it was continued to go on. Was uh, again unique about this, and unknown to most of the people at the time, is this is one of our forward nuclear storage areas, probably the most forward that we had, uh, the only one in Europe. And so the incident was of great importance to them. You had the Belgian flights. <clears throat> yeah, this, so what finally happened had put all of this together, that briefing had gone up. So finally I went to, we were totally unfunded. And so anybody who participated had to come up with their own funds. And uh, so finally it was time to, to transition. I was going to go and ask, literally ask for money. And uh, General Abramson was then the head of SDI. Uh, this is a $5 billion program, which at the time was the biggest in Department of Defense. Remember, this is the big Star Wars initiative. Some think it actually uh, ended the Cold War. Um, it was very interesting because we went in and I had a number of people. I started the lead briefing and said, okay. Uh, he did not know why we were coming, obviously, but I had had an intermediary, who, another general who had set it up and said, you know, kind of trust me, take it. So we started talking. I said, okay, we're here. We're talking all of the slides that I said. And all of a sudden, go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Who are you guys really? You know, and so we went around the room and the various agencies that were involved and all that. Um, clearly not on his scope. And so then I got to transition and said, look, we think this is serious, something that we ought to uh, study seriously and would like to get, to get a project started. And the response was, look, I'm doing some hairy stuff. And Congress was after his budget. And he says, I'm doing hairy stuff, but if I get caught doing this, you know, they're going to take my budget away. You know, this is just a bridge too far. So although, and he did say, he said, look, we're going to monitor more of space than we ever have before. If you can give me the algorithms, what to look for, we'll consider incorporating that, but I'm not uh, joining a team. Uh, a friend of mine later, this is uh, Dean Judd. Uh, Dean and I got to work together. This is after I went to uh, Los Alamos, but Dean had been the uh, technical director for SDI. And then later the NIO, National Intelligence Officer for all research uh, and development. And the point is that um, he knew space architectures and basically everything was up there for me. And Dean was down there in the skeptic category, uh, but willing to listen and participate. But the point is, here are the guys who are in the absolute need to know uh, area and not uh, uh, definitely no involvement on their part. L later on, Dean and I actually ended up on the uh, advisory panel to the Special Operations Command. So a good friend, we spent hours and hours talking uh, about these things. Now, my first-hand testimony, this is why I come down again. I asked yesterday, uh, Edward Teller, surprised you have to tell, Teller was the father of the hydrogen bomb, okay? Um, so at the time, uh, remember 47 when Roswell supposedly happened, this is a guy who is in charge of the most energy of the world that we have ever known. And I had Teller over for dinner, literally, talked about UFOs interested, knowledge on it, not at all. Uh, ben Rich, if you're familiar with Ben, he is the uh, second head of the uh, Skunk Works. Uh, similarly, interested. Uh, I know what Jan Hartson has said about that. Jan had a brief talking with him. I spent days with uh, Ben Rich and time specifically addressing. And he, for the Skunk Works, he did have a shopping list. He said, you know, I want the propulsion system and the, 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 the stealth and all of that. And all of them, as I said, the heads of all of the intelligence agencies. And the answer was no. Let's see what I have. I said, one of the ones I mentioned, there was one who's the head of one of those three letter agencies, uh, Lieutenant General, uh, who is in a system where they would have to know if there were this global information. I mean, they work on the global level. Um, and his response was, a, we don't do that. There are no requirements for our organization to do it. B, 
tell you about the ones I saw. So here's the guy who has had personal experience having seen things flying around that he knew beyond any of our capability and yet did not translate to his agency. Um, Phoenix Lights, Lynn's here, I will bow to her on this one, but I thought one of the biggest things that uh, disservices were done was uh, your uh, governor, uh, Symington, coming out and spoofing it, uh, and then uh, later finding out that he, in fact, uh, had seen it. Uh, great case, again, thousands of witnesses. Um, I put in here, well, Lynn's telling me today that uh, we thought it started at Henderson, said no, it was even earlier than that and was seen later than Tucson after that. And most importantly, again, not a singular event. Uh, this is a uh, picture that was taken that I think is, is one of the ones that really stands up. And the point was, uh, uniquely, instead of looking up at something, this is from the plane shooting down and seeing a UFO there. Interesting, the, um, the pilot at the time uh, had not uh, seen it. B-52, uh, this is a, a great case. And point out one of the problems with Blue Book. Uh, this is one you had a B-52 flying out there. Uh, on a, it's on a practice run. It's called on the way back, and it says, uh, "We want you to go someplace," and you know, give them the route. And they said, "What are we looking for?" And they say, yeah, "You'll know it if you see it." And what the crew did is they flew over and they see this craft hovering off the ground. Now, in addition, there are other witnesses on the ground that uh, were reported. Uh, something came up and chased the UFO, they, or chased the B-52, and they take a picture and you actually see it uh, there. Uh, thousands of uh, sightings. Uh, Bill Coleman is uh, interesting. Unfortunately, he recently died. And um, the really unfortunate part is that uh, uh, Bill had, he was the uh, director of, uh, or the uh, uh, public information officer in the Pentagon for the Air Force. And when he took the job, he had to be interviewed by the secretary. And they got the B thing came up, and he says, "You know, I am not neutral, because he had had his own sighting." Um, again, in the book we chased it. This is one where they were chasing it up and down and across trees. So sort of whatever he was chasing, as they went across, says he's an old dirt farmer uh, from Alabama, and this is in that area. And this thing is flying so low and so fast. Whatever is doing is kicking up dirt uh, as it went along. So, very interested uh, in it. Uh, he did uh, one of the famous cases about what happened at Holloman Air Force Base, you know, and yep, he says he's the guy who went in and uh, confiscated uh, that film. He also confiscated stuff from uh, Gordon Cooper um, and told very why. Now, when he got out, when he retired, he went to work with Jack Webb, and some of you know, after Dragnet, he also did a UFO study. <clears throat> the unfortunate thing is the last line, because he told me that he had, I think it was 107 cases that he considered high strangeness, high reliability, and they wanted to get it out. And this is one of the problems with us aging dinosaurs, where this stuff is going out and then, you know, the data just disappears. And, uh, uh, now, the Nimitz case, this is one you're probably familiar with, and this came out a little over a year ago. Remember the New York Times article came out, and what's interesting is here's the key assessments. Uh, you know, uh, unknown, uh, unknown aircraft characteristics, evades radar, uh, aerodynamics we don't understand, uh, ability to cloak, and, you know, possibly detected well, some of the studies say this thing, they were seen very high, very low, and then down right on the deck in the ocean, and apparently communicating with something that was moving uh, under the ocean. My point is, this is from the actual the conclusions of the report that came out of their study, and yeah, we knew that. Uh, the guy who ran the study was Lou Alessandro, uh, if you can get, he now works for um, uh, Tom DeLong at uh, To The Stars. And where he had an advantage, he was able to actually get $22 million. Now, like the remote viewing program, people say, wow, $22 million. 
in Pentagon funding, we're not even talking lunch money, particularly when you adver uh, amortize this over a number of years, uh, which has uh, happened here. Uh, but I do give him credit. He was more successful. Like I say, mine, I got uh, turned down. And uh, I know he's here. I just wonder if you notice who was uh, you know, behind us when this picture was taken. Look, right, Alondro. Uh, so I did, a, you know, I did a comparison between my study, what they call the advanced you know, ATP, advanced theoretical physics, um, and the DIA study, and what you find is basically, you know, everything's the same except I didn't get any funding. They got very modest and funny. We found there was no institutional interest. Uh, they found that, uh, you know, very limited institutional interest. Um, by the way, I, I do know they are. There is some stuff that's going on, I'm pretty sure now. Um, embarrassment is one of the key issues. And why I read it. one of the things that did happen is when uh, that study was set up, it was set up in such a way that um, it was in plain sight, it was not cla uh, the, the write up was uh, not classified, and it was to find advanced threats. So what happened is, again, this is getting back to understanding how the system works, um, other organizations start looking at this advanced threats, we do advanced threats, and literally went in and scarfed up their money, uh, which is partially what led to their uh, demise. Now, I'm going to argue that I'm not sure if you want governments involved. So what is it that the U.S. government actually brings to UFO studies? Advanced sensors, no doubt about it. They've got some sensors that are not built. They've got brain power uh, in the laboratories, but if you have the national laboratories involved, uh, some highly credible uh, witnesses. Uh, if you can make a case that it's mission related, as we've seen with some modest uh, amounts of money, downside is you know, almost certainly going to classify it just because they can. And the reason is these organizations are highly risk avoidance and embarrassment is considered a risk. Um, so you know, if you want to get them involved, there is a downside to it. Now, one of the things I point out is I said, okay, I had my study in Lucidity or the other public. What else? My question is, why aren't there a hell of a lot more? I went and ran the numbers, and there are 692 authorized general officer admiral slots. Um, if you look at it since Blue Book, and I, that's about 6,000 uh, generals you know, and admirals have been made since that time. If they're like the general population, probably 600 of them have seen something they believe to be a UFO. So my question is not why are there these studies, it's why aren't there a lot more? And again, I think you get to risk avoidance of them. So there's a huge difference between personal interest and institutional uh, interest. And there's about, uh, you know, four million government uh, workers, and that means about 480,000 of them, uh, if you believe this is based on a Gallup poll, have actually seen UFOs. And so they investigated, but their personal interest does not translate to what they do institutionally. Now this is what I call a paradox, is that, you know, most people think uh, Washington's inept. You know, when you, uh, you know, except for UFOs, where they're supposed to be omniscient. They have problems with that. I'm going to skip through some of the ergo fusion. Uh, oh, uh, this is one. You know, I know, and I just saw where Harry Reid actually is calling for uh, uh, you know, congressional studies. In my question, I've, I've talked to Steve about this. He says, why? Yeah, you know, people think of congressional studies as he's thinking of it, you know, like these long hearings that go on for weeks and all. You know, I, I picked this particular day, this when I made up the slide in 14. On 5 February, uh, that day, they had four Senate hearings and 17 hearings in the House. 
on the same day. So most of them last a few hours and go absolutely nowhere. And you put on top of that the things that the um, this is the good news is that the congressional approving um, it, it's now uh, down to only 75 percent of us uh, disapprove of them, uh, down from 80 percent. That's what that's good news. Why do you want to go to a body like that uh, with these studies? Uh, so many of you will know uh, Dick Pope, of course. Um, interesting study here was uh, <coughs> Sir Ron Oxbrew, and he came to see me when I was at Los Alamos. Uh, I got a call from an agency that said he wants to meet with me. Had a very pleasant conversation about non-lethal weapons, what I was working on at the time. Um, he went away, and I got a call and says, boy, you really blew that. I said, what do you mean you blew it? He says, you know, we were by ourselves, uh, so we were the only two in the room. He said, well, he wanted to talk about UFOs. Said, Why didn't he say so? You know, they, they didn't say a word. So I was on a NATO study, and I went back, and we uh, did meet. And he had been the, the well, he's important, he was the chief scientific advisor for the Ministry of Defense, okay? So... I'm talking to him, and he, he wants to actually about crop circles was one of the key issues. I said, well, what, what does he want? And they said, well, why don't you talk to Nick Pope? He goes, Nicky? Why, Nicky's father was my deputy. He go, and so the point is, here is the chief minister of defense who his deputy assistant scientific advisor, I'm sorry, scientific advisor, his father is, you know, the deputy who's the, you know, the father of Nick. And they don't, you know, he doesn't know anything about it. Uh, by the way, Nick's father is legendary. He, uh, he has uh, his own, the, the Jeffrey Pope building at the University of Exeter and that, well known ac across the pond. But the, the key issue was that, um, like I say, the, you're not getting, a high, it wasn't popping up uh, high on the um, uh, meter, even though it, people had expressed interest there. Now, what does this mean? The, um, this is what I call the, the gradient on um, uh, if uh, uh, ET. Uh, low end is you got some signal, it confirmed uh, transient, uh, high visibility to up to the hostile attack. So what does low impact look like? Oh, we know what that is. Weak signal, biological samples. You end up having uh, studies and reports out. Uh, people come to MUFON conferences and talk about those things. Uh, you do find that uh, yeah, there's some microbial lick. Uh, one of the guys I do recommend is um, Richard uh, Hoover. And I did meet him at the IUFOC uh, when he spoke here. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting what happened to him with NASA. But he had uh, picked up meteorites in Antarctica from uh, Mars and had found uh, evidence of unicellular life. <clears throat> and the point was he wrote a study at the University of Cosmology, or I'm sorry, uh, the, um, uh, the Cosmological Journal. He got invited to one of the most prestigious conferences, the straight scientific uh, conference. And he, as he's getting ready to go, all of a sudden the superiors come in and say, your trip is canceled. What do you mean? We're not clearing you to give the talk on the information that you've already published. They were withholding it. Um, so, uh, like I say, in, when you get into this area, NASA is overtly hostile to it. So what's uh, medium impact? You know, periodic sightings and that, and that's pretty much status quo. We, we do know what that is. Uh, sightings, programs, meetings, etc. Uh, high visibility. Uh, well, what happens if you have a long-term event? I use the day the Earth stood still as kind of an example. What would happen with that? Now, I suggest that what you need is what I call the 9-11 model, where you go back to various tragedies. What happened is for a number of hours, TV, uh, all the channels are locked onto it. You're watching what's going on, commentary and whatnot. Uh, but before a short time, remember the, the stations are funded by ads, and they start going back, and oh yeah, there's other things going on in the world. And so it, it, over time, you go back to normal. And the question is, do you have to go to work? The answer is yes, or school. Now, 
if, if you want to know what the driving uh, factors are, if you have a high visibility one, um, I suggest you look at disaster uh, preparation. For instance, you got a hurricane coming and, and what happens there. And the point is that uh, our food supply out there is very, very short. Electronic supplies, gas stations, all of these things run on uh, just in time, if you will. There are very short supply lines uh, behind it. So if, if they're not constantly resupplied, you know, civilization falls apart uh, very quickly. And then, you know, what happens if it's a catastrophic uh, and my answer is that, uh, you know, Tom or Will or no, uh, Sigourney, you're not going to come in and save you. <laughs> yeah, that is not a good scenario. So if ET understands physics enough to get here from that, why do they not understand biology? And if you want to, uh, if they don't want to deal with humans, uh, I don't need live humans to do it. We can do enough with uh, uh, cloning. So this thing about they need us for the DNA and all that. No, they, they understand physics. They say ET says no to free range humans. And I uh, I don't think there's a war with that. And one of the emerging uh, areas that's coming out, of course, is that ET uh, created uh, humans. Um, it's interesting, but it's a uh, concept that's certainly been around for a long time. Um, one of the issues that comes up is that uh, religion would be devastated. My wife actually did the study for uh, Bob Bigelow, and the, they uh, had a thousand clergy for uh, contact at very high return rate. And the bottom line was no big deal. I say one of the things, except for the Jesuits, they said, ah, more converts. <clears throat> this is where. So my, one of my questions is, uh, you know, why do we believe that ET? because of technological advances, therefore potentially more spiritual advanced. And I suspect that that is wish wishful thinking. And what we have seen, uh, church attendance at least, over, the, over time is, has been decreasing as education has gone up. So why do we have to investigate, or you expect the government to investigate uh, those claims without uh, claims for the miracles? And in the second half, we're going to get into some kind of wild and wonderful things there. Uh, and so I say, you know, I know this is a popular MUFON shirt during the Air Force job, and I, I happen to disagree that it's the uh, Air Force's job that E.T. would come and has to come and land on uh, an Earth. Um, this is, we are, or, or, I'm sorry, land on the, in the U.S. or in the, the White House lawn or something. Say, we're one of 195 countries. We have 4% of the global population. What is it that makes us so special that something coming a gazillion miles would end up, you know, just uh, in the U.S.? Um, interest level, this is one that I picked up. You know, people go, wow, and uh, no offense, Alejandro, and I know they talk about the number of getting more than a thousand people there. This is big conference. You know, this is Comic-Con. Draws 167,000 uh, people. Um, biggest in the world uh, for a single day was, and I had never, I had to look this guy up. Um, but the, the point was, you know, four million people attending it. Uh, we went to Comela, which is held every 12 years where the Sidhus uh, come together, um, and having the sins washed away in the Gadavari River there. Um, I've created some new ones, but that's okay. But the, uh, the, the point is, that day we had four million people uh, at that particular place. So when you say, you know, it, it's important, you know, let's go into the compared to what? Uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if, you know, as we hear from up, the others are here, said, well, if they came, they rode in with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, haven't seen them do, do much about the uh, epidemic of uh, poverty. Uh, food shortages around the world still continue, uh, certainly not helping with the wars that are going on. And so it's compared to what? This bottom figure here, I, I usually do this. Upon it. Sometime today, the budget will, uh, deficit is 22 trillion, 129 million. And in reality, I mean, these numbers are spinning so fast you can't, you can't even see them. So 
the point from, again, the government perspective is what do you want the government to focus on? If priority is this, uh, where do you think UFOs are going to do compared to terrorism? Uh, use um, uh, this uh, Christopher, you know, this ranger who was, this is a number of years ago now, but he was returning from his 14th combat tour. Um, people don't realize it, but we now got kids who enlisted whose entire career has been during combat. We have people in, who have been in, literally in combat longer than three times longer than anybody in World War II. So, you know, what's the problem? What are you going to work? Uh, what are the probabilities of seeing it? Uh, being killed by a terrorist uh, is, I say, one in uh, uh, three million. Uh, your probability of uh, seeing a UFO today is about the same. Your probability of seeing one in a lifetime, one in ten. So what about uh, Apollo? Oh, Apollo was about more than going to the moon. Apollo was about establishing American technological dominance in the world. And here are the number of the ones that I asked. You know, but, uh, Edgar and I sat on board, as did, I was on board with uh, Jack Schmidt uh, on Apollo 17. Now, if we knew that it was not a problem, remember that when Apollo 11, 12 came back, they went into isolation. And uh, that was just worrying about microbes. So if there were the slightest possibility that uh, ET might have, you know, the astronauts might have bumped into ET, uh, you would think there had been protocol. Now, it is not that they didn't discuss this. And a friend of mine, Helen uh, Kupperman, was a lawyer. She said, yeah, we, we discussed that. And by the way, the protocols are what is uh, mandated. And that was, if ET, you have uh, firm evidence, then instant worldwide release. Ah, Roswell, this is where I get into uh, lots of uh, trouble. One thing I point out that Roswell was not a big deal until the 1980s um, and came out. Um, uh, you know, here's the thing. Um, by the way, uh, I knew Jesse Jr., and I think he was absolute straight shooter. Um, he's one of the few people who would come in and say, my experience was 15 minutes long, and he would stick straight, straight to that and not expand, as we have seen with uh, many others. Um, actually, Bill Burns had a, a study or a, a TV program, and they had laid out a series of thin materials and uh, Jesse Jr. and another one, uh, the Sergeant Fullier, who we believe did have their hands on, there was material, something did happen at Roswell, I'm not suggesting that that didn't, but who d had their hands on it, went in and they both went, that's it, or that's what it looks like. And there was a very pragmatic uh, answer to it. Uh, the presidential paradox is, uh, I know we like to think that the presidents are going to If you look at how close the, the elections uh, have been, we know some of these. Um, do you think that these people who would sell their mother to be elected, if they had the information, wouldn't have used it at the right time? I find that one uh, hard to believe. Uh, yeah, this is one that I use. Yeah. I did a study on, on the internet, and then what I had run into that there were a list of 38 uh, crashes, 122 bodies, and uh, 14 live ETs reported. And my point is that if uh, you, uh, ET is coming here across the galaxy and that bumping into each other, they have a quality control problem. I mean, they haven't even figured out, we have like collision avoidance, you know, your new car when you drive oranges, somebody's alongside you, uh, apparently hadn't figured that one out. Um, my uh, advice to skeptics has been uh, do nothing. Uh, the the uh, uh, UFO community, if you will, will work on uh, self-emulating uh, and doing uh, all of the work uh, for you. Um, you know, I mean, 
I'm going to move really quickly. Uh, again, the UFO book, I have an entire chapter on Corso. We, we NIDS, knew of Corso before uh, it was found. George Knapp, you may not have mentioned it, but he was supposed to be the co-author with uh, uh, Corso, and for a lot of reasons, bumped out. But uh, we did, I did, you know, there's a lot of study on all of the technologies. And what you see is the technologies advance like this. They do not uh, at any point make us up. One of the ones that I'm personally familiar with, I have night vision. The guy who literally built night vision lab was a friend of mine. And I went to him because of some of the... He was also open. I might mention we had a meta spoon dining party, one of the worst I ever had uh, in his, his laboratory. But he had... Um, you know, we asked him about some of the claims that were in there, you know, the alien eyeballs and the difference between ambient light and IR systems and just absolutely not. The unfortunate thing was um, I wrote, which is in the book, I wrote Phil a seven-page letter saying, you know, this one-liner, this is not true. Uh, it's a Delphi, Maryland, not a Delphia, to big things like, no, E.T. was not a cover for fighting the Cold War. Um, or, I'm sorry, the Cold War was not a cover for fighting uh, E.T. Um, unfortunately, uh, he had a heart attack. I was down, my son was getting married. We went up and spent a day together. He says, yeah, I need to write another book and correct it. He was working on it. Uh, Phil was not computer, uh, computer literate, so uh, he was handwriting and typing things. And um, I guess a uh, little over a week later, had a second heart attack and died, and that was the end of that. Um, it was interesting, some of you may know, Chase Branding in 2012 said, I saw this, I wrote a FOIA. Um, got, uh, by the way, I might mention FOIA. Um, I have filed one a little over a year ago, and I think the system has just totally gone off the rails. Um, they're required within 30 days to answer. I got a response that says, uh, as after 30 days, it said, wait out. About a year later, I got a second letter that said, well, yeah, we have such files, they're in the queue, and gave me the reference number you know, where I was, and at the rate they were clearing them, it would be another three years. So you'd have like four years to get to FOIA. So you know, that system's just not going to work. Um, Yeah, no, sorry, there's no huge uh, budget. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention with Apollo that was important, at the time of the Apollo mission, uh, NASA had 4% of the budget, the federal budget. Uh, right now, they're at about 0.4%, uh, so it tells you something about uh, relative uh, priorities. Um, sorry, this, uh, the whole thing with Lazar does not work. Um, and uh, I'll tell you the quick story. Edward Teller, I mentioned him earlier, was a personal friend of mine. And the story went that uh, Lazar was reading the paper. Uh, Edward, or Ed as he calls him, uh, his protégés call him Dr. Teller. Uh, but uh, Lazar calls him Ed and said he was leaning against the paper or against the wall reading the paper and blah, blah, blah. Uh, what most people don't know is that uh, when Dr. Teller was 18 years old in Austria, he slipped, uh, or in Hungary, he slipped under a railroad car and had his leg trans uh, traumatically amputated and could not lean. Uh, and also I had took the opportunity to ask him, and you know, because the thing was that Teller supposedly made uh, a magic wand and they bypassed all of the intelligence uh, explanations and all of that. Uh, disclosure project. Um, if you believe stuff Greer puts out, you know, he said, we have been flying these things uh, since uh, 19, late 50, uh, 50s and 60s. Um, absolutely impossible. Oh. Oh, this one I'll put up because this is a MUFON case. Uh, if you remember, the um, Malaysian Air 370 disappeared, and the Pennsylvania representative goes on CNN and others saying that, that the aliens snatched the uh, airplane out of the air. Uh, terribly not helpful. I think 
I am going to skip um, uh, some of the key issues here, and this gets to funding, and then I'll, we'll take a, uh, the break. Um, war, research is terribly uh, expensive. You know, we have something called the Large Hadron Collider, which is looking for the God particle, or what was the Higgs boson, and after they discovered that. Uh, but the point is, the startup cost for 13 billion on that, and about a billion a year, uh, a year to run after it. And um, uh, space research is expensive. Uh, this is a figure I didn't. You know, we got people that are up on the ISS now. A man day on the ISS is over seven million dollars per day. Now, one of the things I don't know if I have a slide in there with this, but it says that uh, my guesstimate is that all of the research into these various phenomena that are out there. Globally, probably nets about $10 million per year. So I use that as a, a comparison for the kinds of uh, you know, serious scientific projects uh, that are out there. Um, yeah. And one of my, my points, I, I also, Pat saying, is that uh, the phenomena of ufology is at least as complex as cancer or AIDS. And yet, when you look at the amount of research that's being put on, and it's minuscule. And the point is, from, a, again, the government's perspective, you have a zero-sum game, you have things you're going to fund, uh, you run out of money long before you run out of things that you uh, need to fund. Uh, again, about, you know, has, has there been a big leap? If you look at, here are the advances. We've been at war since uh, 01. Usually technologies advance uh, during there, and they have. Don't see anything that looks like ET. Uh, you do see a lot of stuff in uh, robotics and uh, micro and whatnot. Uh, DARPA putting in more than 100 billion per year into lift uh, capabilities. Um, you don't see any of them looking like ET technologies. Where are we going? Space ventures. Um, again, uh, you know some of these folks. Uh, this is uh, you know the Bigelow uh, space with the ISS uh, being attached to it. Uh, what you're finding is a lot of rich guys. Uh, you know. Uh, Musk and Bozos and them putting in lots of money, but you don't see anything that looks like ET technology. And this is a, a final word in the UFO books. Is in the end, it is clear that the universe is far more complex than we ever imagined. We are not even close to solving the enigmas posed by UFOs. Rather, we are still at the front end of defining the fundamental issues and boundaries. So I guess we break here and we will come back and we will talk about things other than UFOs, but we'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs>